My name is Steve Crawley and I'm here to deliver de-icing anti-icing theory and practical uh, instruction and this video has been put together to aid that instruction from a theoretical point of view and also a practical point of view. We'll be looking today at different types of rigs that you may experience there out in the field, how they operate, how the different controls operate and how you should manage the vehicles themselves. Obviously key to uh, managing the vehicles is training so what sort of training aspects you have to deal with and must cover it in a module format. We'll also look at fluid management, how the fluid is stored and a sort of quality checks that you are likely to experience and have to carry out on a daily basis, particularly in a winter situation. We'll also look at the safety issues from the personnel, why it's important to do de-icing and anti-icing of aircraft and we'll also interview key personnel who actually operate the rigs and also pilots that have to experience the winter conditions and why it's important for them from a safety point of view and obviously from an operational point of view. The rig behind me is an FMC LMD 2000 rig. Well known within the business, lots of operators are using this type of rig and it's easy to use and also it's uh, easy to drive, very maneuverable and the actual basket operations, the joystick operations are user friendly as well. So actually moving around the aircraft, around the, the wings, the horizontal stabiliser, the boom has a very good reach so uh, large aircraft, narrow bodied and wide bodied aircraft can be treated with this rig and they're also very, uh, uh, very easy to maintain from an MT point of view, from an engineering point of view as well. So it's got two tanks. You can have a de-icing tank, which is used for de-icing the aircraft, which is heated. And then the second tank, if you need to do anti-icing operations, then it has a second tank that you can put pure 100% anti-icing fluid into it. Very easy controls within the, uh, the cab and also within the, the basket itself. And there's a two-way communication, normally hardwired between the driver and the basket operator. Must be continuous while they're actually spraying. And also the basket operator must always be wearing a full body harness. Must do a body harness check to ensure that the harness is uh, fit for use no wear tears. This is a typical sort of lance that you will experience in most de-icing vehicles. It can be used for removing frost or removing ice and snow or slush but this one can be obviously be adjusted to a narrow jet for obviously blasting down and actually get penetrating ice and then the heat of the fluid actually penetrates through the ice through the layers and that helps to break the ice off. But if you put it on a wide fan coned uh, setting then obviously that will give you a nice wide spread effect pattern which is good for removing the normal frost that you will get in most morning conditions which is classed as fall frost. This is another type of gun that you will experience, this is named as the snow gun, very good at removing snow deposits, also can be adjusted to a wide fan or a complete direct jet, uh, very good to removing but one thing to remember about this gun is if you use it for frost conditions you will use a lot of fluid and the right gun and the right setting is very important. Right the last gun we're going to talk about today is the ground gun which is used for underwing de-icing. One very important thing to remember about this gun is positioning of the vehicle making sure that the actual side of the vehicle is to the wing or to the side of the aircraft that you are going to treat. Also be very aware that when you rewind the gun, make sure that you've actually got the trigger in the right position, otherwise you will get covered in spray. One very important safety issue that you must all be aware of is the actual emergency boom controls. They're fitted to all de-icing vehicles and you should be aware of how they operate in the circumstances where the boom operation hydraulics fail. And then the joysticks, you can operate the actual boom to lower, raise, and to get the personnel down to a safe level. Okay, when you refill the de-icing vehicles themselves, one important issue is to remember that if they've got more than one tank, that you actually refill the right tank. So from a labeling point of view, this one is labeled for de-icing fluid, so you know which fluid type that should be going through this nozzle. Uh, we also, the other one is the anti-icing refill tank. So one is a hot tank, one is a cold tank. So very important that you don't get them mixed up. So this is a typical de-icing cab 
uh, driving position the driver will be uh, obviously operating the controls heater controls uh, one important issue as I mentioned earlier is two-way communication so there must always be two-way communication between the driver and the basket operator some of the key points here is before de-icing can actually commence then obviously the fluid has to be heated so the heater controls are actually based within the cab you must ensure that you've got sufficient fluid for the operation and you must before spraying ensure that the actual fluid is at least 60 degrees at the nozzle which means basically around about 80 85 degrees in the tank so the heater must be checked must be, hit, be operating within the cab it must have enough diesel or fuel to actually use the heater and all the safety devices two-way uh, communication must be operational another thing that you must check before op uh, approaching an aircraft is the brakes so at least 30 feet away from the aircraft check the brake operation of the actual vehicle this is jbt aerotech air first rig it incorporates all the same systems as the previous rigs but incorporates a compressed air system which can be used to inject the fluid directly into the airflow or to blast the snow deposits from the aircraft surfaces using the compressed air. As you can see at the moment, it's in the park position, so the nozzle is actually in the vertical position, but the operator can actually move the nozzle from the vertical position down to the horizontal position to actually operate and spray the uh, fluid. The rig that we've got behind us at the moment is a Tempest FMC rig well known within the business lots of operators are using this type of rig before you anybody wears a safety harness one of the important checks is actually checking the harness itself checking for any rips tears any damage to the buckles or the metal work and also checking that the actual harness has had its yearly check its annual check to ensure that it passes its lower check. Uh, if that's okay then obviously wearing the actual hair harness, making sure that it's uh, comfortable, no twisted webbing around the legs and also that it's tight enough, not too tight, tight enough that it will restrain you from coming out the basket in the event of a, a, an emergency or accident. Two-way communication between the driver and the basket operator is essential. Uh, no way can hand signals be used for communication between the, the driver and the basket operator. Numerous act accidents and miscommunication have happened in the operation which has meant damage, injury to aircraft and personnel. De-icing fluid and anti-icing fluid can be stored in different means. The ones we're actually looking at here are IBC containers, which are a very common method. The other method is fixed tanks, which can contain a lot more fluid and are easily more manageable. One of the important things when they are delivered on the IBCs is the delivery label to make sure that you actually got the batch number that relates you to your certificate of conformance and also relates to your test certificate. Also, the, uh, the expiry of the actual fluid varies from two years to three years depending on the manufacturer and the fluid. Ideally these containers should be stored in a, in a closed environment in a, a store or warehouse. UV light can affect the viscosity of the fluid so it's very important this is managed uh, correctly. The tanks we have behind me now are fixed tanks. The advantage of these tanks is that you can store a lot more fluid than the IBC tanks. The IBC containers will only hold 1,000 litres of fluid whereas these will hold several thousand litres of fluid at any one time. Very important aspects to these tanks is that they're labelled to the correct fluid type, mixture and they're also inspected on an annual basis. very important uh, part of the process is getting confirmation from the flight crew that they're happy for you to actually commence de-icing anti-icing applications. Quite a few things, firstly that you've got to configure the aircraft so the horizontal stabiliser has got to be in the nose down position 
so that the fluid runs off the horizontal stabiliser. Secondly, the APU bleeds must be on the off position to prevent any fluid actually being sucked into the APU inlets. Can cause problems with vaporising uh, into the uh, cabin. Can be mistaken for a smoke and has created air turnbacks. So emergency situation, so very important. Also, any doors, hatches, windows, personnel must be clear and ground power units, ground equipment must be clear. Particularly also the fuel bowser, fueling truck must be out of the vicinity before de-icing, anti-icing takes place. So once everybody's happy and the brake checks can been carried out, then we will start down from the uh, wing tip, working down the, the leading edge of the wing, always spraying leading edge to trailing edge so that the fluid runs off the trailing edge that it also includes the horizontal stabiliser. So once the actual basket is uh, in the raised position then the, the vehicle will be uh, restricted to five mile an hour speed limit. Uh, also wind speeds not above 40 knots are allowed for the actual basket to be operated out of its hot position. Also the basket operator is also the eyes of the driver so ensuring that there's no obstacles, ground equipment, personnel around the aircraft and also looking at the rear of the aircraft, uh, the vehicle when it is in the reversing mode. So as the basket goes down the leading edge, the basket operator will be looking for any frost, ice, snow on the, on the flight controls, ensuring that they're clear of the wing. When he's spraying, he will stop and let the steam dissipate before he checks the areas. Optimum spraying is three meters away from the actual aircraft itself. Okay, once he's checked and all the control surfaces, engine cowls are all clean, and he's happy with the underneath and top sides of the wings, then we will move to the horizontal stabilizer position. Fuselage as well, light spray. If there's only a hoar frost on the fuselage, then it only needs a light spray. Yeah. Horizontal stabilizer again, treated similar to the, uh, to the wing. The only thing with the horizontal stabiliser is that uh, the horizontal stabiliser is upside down wing so as though you're not allowed any uh, frost on the top sides of the wing you're not allowed any frost or snow or ice on the underneath of the horizontal stabiliser. They both work in conjunction with the, each other, the wing and the horizontal stabiliser. Tail as well, uh, spray from the top of the tail, let the fluid run down, don't over spray the, the tail because most of the fluid will end up on the ramp or in areas of the aircraft that you do not wish the fluid to enter. Must never be tempted to spray from the rear of the wings or the rear of the stabilizers because what you'll do is you'll blast fluid into all the quiet areas of the control surfaces. Not only can it cause flight problems but then it can during maintenance be very costly to clear the fluid in the gel that's accumulated into the quiet areas. Again driver must ensure that he doesn't go over grates, gullies too fast, do any sharp turns. So exactly the same treatment on the opposite side. Horizontal stabiliser, tail, checking the fuselage, making sure that you're not spraying into the APU inlets. If you get fluid inside the APU inlet, it's also ingested into the air conditioning unit of the aircraft, which on takeoff you can get vapour coming into the cabin, and so it's vital that it's, uh, you minimise the fluid amount around that area. The basket driver is also looking for any damage to the aircraft as well. If they suspect clear ice, then uh, additional steps may be required to do a tactile check a hands-on check because clear ice is, is very difficult to see, can get to two, three inches in thickness and has caused problems and accidents in the past. Another important aspect of the de-icing anti-icing process is you must also be wary that there are areas of the aircraft that you cannot spray fluid into or onto. Now these are areas such as the pitot tubes which are obviously airspeed indicators you can see then they've actually got covers to prevent any ingestion while the aircraft is actually parked. There are also static ports which are on the actual aircraft body. If we walk down these are the actual static ports of the aircraft marked with the red markings. Very important that they're not 
uh, any fluid actually ingested into the or sprayed into the static ports and also the engine inlets. The engine inlets have uh, monitoring systems, sensors that actually if you get fluid in your flight deck can get misreadings. So very important that you do not do the, the no spray areas, spray fluid into them. Wheels and brakes also should not be sprayed on. When the aircraft lands, wheels and brakes can be very hot and you can actually damage the brake units by spraying cold or hot de-icing fluid directly onto them. So it should be manually removed or it should be removed by using a hot air cabin heater. Again, important thing here is once the operation is finished, it's always good to have a debrief with the driver and the basket operator, see if there's any lessons to be learnt, any issues while de-icing was taking place and obviously pass that on to colleagues to help continuous improvement of the process. There are three main de-icing anti-icing fluids used in the market. We have a type 1, easily recognisable by its colour, orange in colour, and if you look at the thickness of the fluid, it is used mainly for de-icing because it is very uh, thin and fluid. So very little hold over time for type 1 fluid. Mainly heated to remove the contamination that the ice, snow, slush and snow, uh, but very limited on hold over times. Essential for de-icing fluid is that it must be applied at 60 degrees C. This must be tested using either a fixed thermometer or a handheld thermometer at the point of heating. You actually point the thermometer, infrared this one, into the actual flow of the fluid to ensure you've got at least 60 degrees C. Okay, the next fluid is a type 2 fluid. As you can see, a different colour. The colours are not mandatory, they're just there to distinguish between the different fluid types. But as you can see from this fluid, it's a lot more viscous, a lot more thicker, than the actual type 1 fluid and this gives a better hold over time. Basically the fluid sticks to the wing longer giving it a better protection. The last fluid we have here is type 4, very viscous and the best hold over time characteristics of all the three fluids. Very good and easily recognisable by its bright green colour. Okay again these fluids must all be tested for the different thickness using uh, a field viscosity instrument. Must also check that you've got the right mixture using a refractometer to ensure you've got the right refractive index. For instance, type two fluid, if it's in a mixture rate of 75-25, which is 75% anti-icing fluid to 25% water, then it has a refractive index of 1.377. 100% fluid, for instance, in the type four fluid, 100% neat fluid has a refractive index of 1.392. It's vital for me that all surfaces are free when I come to take off. Now, if they're not, it impacts on four very crucial parts of my life, professional life. Lift is reduced. Drag is then increased. Obviously weight, because I'm carrying more weight, is increased. But probably the most fundamental part is that the aircraft stall speed is increased. And that means at the back my wings are going to drop. I'm going to know about it far too late in the, get in the day to do anything about it meaningfully. And that's the end of the aircraft. And you know I don't have to say any more about what that means to everybody involved. If the guys on the ground make a mess of the operation from a de-icing point of view, then operational efficiency has gone out of the window. Now this has a huge human factor from a negative point of view for me. It's going to delay my flight, which means that you know there's going to be an extra stress element that I don't need around me at that part of the day. And crucially, it could increase costs um, because somewhere down the line, if we're delayed, then my clients, uh, what we're carrying, it could mean that it's going to be a penalty at the end of the day. This training video has been put together to help 
emphasise the importance of de-icing, anti-icing from a flight deck's point of view and also from a ground operations point of view. The safety of the aircraft is paramount and also the personnel involved in the operation. So training modules from a modular format, we've run through the different types of vehicles. We've looked at the areas of the aircraft that need treating. We've also looked at the areas that don't need treating from a safety point of view. The training modules are put together and hopefully you've enjoyed this training module and you're able to pass this knowledge on into the operation itself.